The common question I get is, now I'm giving formula, is there any point continuing to breastfeed? There's a bit of an idea that once you introduce formula to your baby's stomach, you've ruined everything that breastfeeding could do, and that's simply not true. Breast milk is a living thing it's made from your white blood cells which is your immune system so every single time you put breast milk in your baby's stomach you're giving them your immune system i mean that's just that still blows my mind i've known about that for seven years now it's still like wow that's amazing and it doesn't matter if you've also given them some formula you're still then going to give them your immune system afterwards and you know and anything you've been exposed to in your environment is therefore, you know, the antibodies to that are going into your baby. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Motherhood Made Magic podcast. Today I am speaking with Lucy Ruddle. Lucy is an international board certified lactation consultant. She's a holistic sleep coach and international speaker on parent-centered care in the lactation field. She has a background in child development and psychology and runs a thriving, listening-focused private practice business in the UK. She is also a mum to two boys. Welcome, Lucy. Hi, Anna. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk to you today. Well, I've been following you online for a while. I think you are one of the most passionate and also one of the funniest people in the online motherhood lactation support space and when I saw that you had another book out I thought this would be the perfect sort of thing to bring you on and and talk with you about because I think we were just speaking off air that the work that we are both doing is bringing out the untold stuff into the into the open so before we get to that I'd really love to hear what was your transition to motherhood like of the expectation versus the reality how has it been for you oh my goodness and I was I was reading your book this morning and the first bit where you talk about expectation versus reality you know that that image of pristine white baby grows on the washing line and in my head it was going to be you know play dates and baking and beautiful sunshine streaming in through my window as I effortlessly nursed my baby (laughs) <laughs> the reality was incredibly far removed from that I completely fell apart in the first six weeks of becoming a mother um, and I feel like I still have regular periods where I fall apart seven years down the line right and I'm sure you resonate with that too mm. yeah for sure that's really part and parcel of it that we are going through these uh-huh. cycles of falling apart and getting it together but then also in some ways being undercut or being led to believe that things should be different to how they are we should be doing things differently we should be doing more yes our society has so much to answer for with regards to like being a perfect mother you know you should be doing this and you should be doing that and it's like you, you can't do all the things you have I'm learning slowly that we have to do what works for us in the moment because then we're better parents because we're calmer and when we're calmer when we're more connected when we're more connected our children get more from us and you know, I, I wish we could kind of bin off that that pressure that so mm. many of us have to deal with every day. And holding that in the one hand, but also knowing that that anger is a valid emotion that we shouldn't just like always wash away with deep breaths. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to have a good rage. Absolutely. <laughs> Did you know all of the things that you know now? about lactation and about breastfeeding when you became a mother or did you find this became a passion born out of your own more difficult experience than what you expected that's it so before I became a mother um, I had I worked at a sure start children's center um, and part of that role included having to have some awareness of breastfeeding so we'd all trotted along and done this four-hour breastfeeding awareness course and therefore I was an expert on breastfeeding and I wasn't going to need any help you know thank you very much and the midwives came around after my son was born and they were like, you know, do you need any help? I was like, no, nope, I know what I'm doing. I've done a four hour workshop on how to support people to breastfeed. And funnily enough, within about six hours, I had blisters on my nipples and it was really hurting. And I quickly understood that I knew very little about breastfeeding. And as my journey unfolded, as I stopped breastfeeding and then started again and then had my second son, he wouldn't latch. By that point where I'd gone through so much stuff with breastfeeding just being difficult, I realized that I didn't, if no one, most people didn't know enough about breastfeeding to offer the support that was needed. And I wanted to be able to fill that gap. So 
that was what kind of led me eventually to, to training as a lactation consultant, just a complete lack of good, good support, really, and good information. Yeah, and I have seen how you have transitioned over the past couple of years with lockdowns and restrictions and things to change that support as it's required in different circumstances for different families too. I think so many of us have had to do that over the last 14 months or so, haven't we? You know, there was this period, I think, when the pandemic first started and we were all put in lockdown where a lot of us just went, well, that's it. I can't support anybody then. And I kind of really shut down and said, no, I can't do Zoom calls. It's not going to work. And so many people were messaging me saying, I really need help. I can't get to a support group. I kind of got pushed into I'm going to have to find a way to support these people, right? Mm. I'm going to have to do more online. And honestly, it's been the best thing for my practice. And I think for a lot of parents as well, because a lot of the courses that I'm running, a lot of the workshops that I'm doing, they couldn't have come to before because they live in Scotland or London. And, you know, I was running them face to face, but doing stuff online is helping so many more people. it's, It's great when we are forced to become more flexible, I think. Yes, I would agree with you on that. I want to get straight into hearing about your latest book and the journey in writing it. The title is Mixed Up. I want to know why, as the top level international qualification that you can have as a lactation consultant, why you then went and wrote a book about the use of formula (laughs) and breast milk substitutes. Right. It's very controversial, isn't it? I'm (laughs) I'm still waiting for... um for somebody to take away my registration or to kind of run me out of town, you know, waiting for that to happen. Um, The the issue is, or the the situation is that in the United Kingdom, by the time a baby is six weeks old, they're probably having some sort of formula or donor milk pop up. And we know this, we've known this for a long time, and yet there's very little out there in the form of easy to access, consistent, evidence-based support for those parents who are using formula and who actually want to continue giving some sort of breast milk alongside long term. Uh, So it started off with me being so fed up answering the same questions from parents Mm -hmm. over and over again that I wrote a fact sheet and then that became like a little booklet and then I realized there was a whole book in it and what 200 pages later (laughs) here we are. (laughs) So that really covers the first bit. Why does this book have to exist? You talk about the different types of combination feeding. I don't know about you, but I, I know you kind of, you're a doula and you support parents. So parents tend to assume that you can breastfeed or you can formula feed. And that if you're combination feeding, it's probably through choice. They might think that, oh, I've made a decision to give my baby one bottle of milk at bedtime, for example, and that's combination feeding. What we know, though, is that giving any type of formula or donor milk is combination feeding, even if you're having to top your baby up because their weight gain isn't fantastic, that's combination feeding. So we have to divide it into two different categories, people who are combination feeding through choice and people who are combination feeding because they have to. And I'm not sure what kind of what you see in your work, Anna, but I'm guessing you see a lot of having to top babies up. It is quite common in Australia. I think the the sort of trajectory that Australian families go through statistically is very similar to the UK. So the latest stats that I saw, it's over 90% of mothers in Australia initiate breastfeeding and there are sharp declines around that six week to two month mark. And again, by four months, it's dropped off and again by six months. So in terms of getting to that six month mark, it's only around a quarter of Australian babies that are being exclusively breastfed to six months. Yeah. Wow. That's better than the UK. Um, we, have, okay. we, have one, we have one percent of babies at six months who are still being breastfed. So doing very well. <laughs> but that's pretty impressive. Even if it's, you know, five percent, you're doing better than us. So, uh, yeah. OK. Um, but, you know, those parents that you're seeing in those early weeks who are having to top up due to weight concerns or pain or just anxiety about their milk supply you know that's one type of combination feeding then you have the parents who are anxious about feeding in public or who are having to go back to work early and too worried about kind of doing lots of pumping so they choose to combination feed and then you have the parents who perhaps have breastfed before and find it really challenging and have found that in order to give any breast milk to their baby this time around they need to take the pressure off themselves and say do you know what I'm going to do a bit of both and I think we can kind of break combination feeding down into those categories. 
as we were saying earlier, Lucy, that kind of we think of this idea that it's only breast or bottle, the same as we think it's only stay at home or working mum. And mm. where, you know, we spend most of our time in between both camps or we spend a bit of time in each and, and mostly somewhere in the middle. So it's so valuable yes. to have this kind of a resource. Absolutely. What do we need to know about formula and its history before we can start making some of these choices? Oh my goodness. The history of formula just fascinates me. It's really interesting. It goes a really long way back to the 1800s. It, it's just a really interesting stuff. And it's such a shame that it got picked up by commercialization because if it was used as it was intended i.e to keep babies alive when human milk wasn't available it would well, it is it's a life-saving medicine that grows babies i mean that is that's a modern miracle sadly <laughs> um, mr nestle Hon Henri, Henri nestle realized that he could sell this at quite a big profit and he's quoted as saying something like the mothers will do my promotion for me um, because he realized that he could really take advantage of, of mums and get more people to buy his product when perhaps it wasn't needed they used to a lot of the companies would go to doctors and hospitals and talk about how their formula was a modern marvel it was more it, because it was science milk it was better than human milk because they knew what mm. was in it and so the doctors would tell the mothers this stuff's amazing you know you should be giving this to your baby and then babies were unfortunately dying because we didn't have the sterilization methods that we have now they didn't have the clean water access they would often use the same bottle without washing it for days at a time it would mm. just be a breeding ground for bacteria it's a really tricky area because on the one hand it's an amazing thing but on the other hand it's been completely i don't even know what i want to say about it it's just been destroyed almost by commercialization. The purpose of it's been corrupted. That's it. That's a really good way of saying it. Yeah. And the markup now on the tin of formula is huge. You know, you pay a lot more for formula than it costs to make it. And part of that is because all you know, the clubs that they run, all the free toys that they give you, all of the helplines, the money they use for that goes into the cost of the formula. So they reclaim it from the tin of formula. So if they stop doing all of that, they wouldn't have to charge as much for their formula, but they would make less profits. And they're putting profits above health. And that's the problem with it. You know, that, that's the issue with formula. And the interconnection between what is meant to be breastfeeding services and perhaps a vested interest in sponsorship. I saw some coverage that you were part of about a formula or a bottle company, perhaps, that was sponsoring the National Breastfeeding conference of some kind yeah oh, yes there was that was, was that the mid i think it might have been a midwife conference being sponsored by i can't remember who was sponsoring it oh i do it was a formula company that was sponsoring or speaking at a midwife conference and, and sponsoring it and of course they have a vested interest in being there at that midwife conference of course they do <laughs> you know? yeah and any you know the who code the code we have that's supposed to protect babies and mothers and professionals from these companies says that they shouldn't be allowed to, they shouldn't be there. They're, 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 it's not allowed. It's not safe. It's not appropriate. It's, it's so frustrating because mm. it's hurting so many people, you know? Yes. And I could speak at length about how it has been maladapted in Australia too, but I don't think that's the point because we're not here to try and vilify the people who are needing to use the formula it's a life-saving exactly. medicine as you say yes. so you know i have a real passion about speaking with about mum guilt and the grief that is inextricably linked with motherhood yes is that something that is one of the more common things that people come to you with that guilt oh, and grief yes. about about using combination feeding yes yes it's huge it's it would be very rare for me to sit with a mother and for those feelings to not come up you know, you don't have to dig very deep or very hard to, to get, you know, oh, I feel guilty. I feel like I failed. I can't even do this thing my body's supposed to do. Those feelings are absolutely huge and they kind of get in the way, you know, they ruin our enjoyment of, of our babies, you know, because we're spending so much time worrying about giving them the poison <laughs> that is formula as, as we often see it or worrying about whether this breastfeed is going to go well or are they going to finish all of their bottle and therefore they didn't get enough from me this i mean it takes over their minds and then they forget to enjoy their babies all because of 
the way that we, we support breastfeeding and infant feeding in our society, we're doing such a disservice to most mothers. It mm. really is heartbreaking. And then being involved in also holistic sleep support, as is your background, seeing how that stress cycle of the weight and the milk and the mm. guilt and the grief and not being able to sleep because baby's hungry or they're wired or all of those things. And it's not surprising why our maternal mental health rates and issues are as they are. Oh, yeah, absolutely. If we, if we could better support mothers, we would have, I'm convinced there would be far less postnatal depression and anxiety because we're vulnerable as new mums, right? We, we need mothering ourselves. And unfortunately, we live in a society that doesn't give us that. You know, you go to the doctor and they'll prescribe you antibiotics or medication or antidepressants, depending on what you need. And your midwife might come round and weigh the baby and say, you're doing a great job, but no one's going to sit with you, wrap you up in a blanket, give you a cup of tea and hold your hand, you know, and, and that's what mothers need more than anything is just mothering themselves. And I'm sure if we did more of that, we would just have more breastfeeding, less depression and everyone would be happy. Yep. I'm so totally with you on that. <laughs> Can you speak to some of the benefits of continuing with combination feeding rather than feeling like you have to do one or the other? Yeah. So the common question I get is now I'm giving formula. Is there any point continuing to breastfeed? There's a bit of an idea that once you introduce formula to your baby's stomach, you've ruined everything that breastfeeding could do. And that's simply not true. Breast milk is a living thing it's made from your white blood cells which is your immune system so every single time you put breast milk in your baby's stomach you're giving them your immune system i mean that's just that still blows my mind i've known about that for seven years now it's still like wow that's amazing and it doesn't matter if you've also given them some formula you're still then going to give them your immune system afterwards and you know and anything you've been exposed to in your environment is therefore, you know, the antibodies to that are going into your baby. And Kelly Mom, um, that wonderful website we often use, talks about how she thinks that 50 mils of breast milk a day is probably going to be enough to be beneficial to babies. The Iowa Extension Service tells us there are 3 million germ-killing cells in one teaspoon of breast milk. This is powerful stuff. And the more we can give it, the longer we can give it, the better the outcomes are for mum and for baby, even if we're only giving a small amount every day. It's, it's just, it's incredibly potent stuff. It, it's, it's just amazing. I don't know if you have this service in the UK, but we have a service where I am in New South Wales in Australia that's called Mother Safe. And it's a hotline where you can ring and speak to someone who knows about the interactions between medications and breastfeeding. When I was pregnant I was I saved this number and I was thinking about it in relation to okay so if I need drugs for something if I need painkillers whatever I can ring them and ask about it ask about vitamins whatever it is but there are people who are really highly trained in actually being able to look at what medications you might need to take and then think oh well perhaps with that medication exposure, it's not safe to completely exclusively breastfeed your baby, but perhaps that 50 or 100 mils a day might be a safe amount. It can give them that immune factor. And then the other 90% of their intake could be formula, but you're still able yeah. to continue with some element of breastfeeding Absolutely. if that's important to you. Yeah. And of course, most drugs are actually completely fine to take while breastfeeding. And if they're not, there's usually an alternative that you can find that is appropriate. But yeah, I think you're right. If particularly if we're giving small amounts of breast milk, there's going to be small amounts of the drug in the breast milk. So that automatically reduces the risk, I, I would think. What are some of the problems that can come about from combination feeding? Or what is the sort of pitfalls or traps that we might find ourselves yes. in that we then have to dig ourselves out of if we choose that path? Or have no choice the biggest one is what we call the top-up trap so this is where you start off giving your baby a bottle of formula perhaps because you haven't been able to settle them at the breast or you've been told by somebody that the weight gain isn't fantastic please give them a bottle and then the baby sleeps through the next breastfeed because you perhaps slightly overfed them with the bottle or when it comes to feed them next time they struggle to latch because they've used a different sucking method at the, with the bottle compared to what they would do with their breast so your breast doesn't get emptied um, and then you know you give another bottle because they won't latch and then because your breasts are getting fuller over time that leads to reduced milk supply because your body goes oh well this milk isn't needed i'll stop making it 
And before you know it, you're giving more and more and more bottles and less and less and less at the breast. And we typically then end up with a baby that won't latch because they're frustrated by the breast, a mother that thinks she's failed, and a baby almost exclusively formula fed. That's the biggest risk um, as far as what I'm seeing on a day to day basis with this. It's very easy to spiral out of control. I have come across the idea of bottle preference a lot Mm -hmm. and had it explained to me that it's essentially like the baby is sucking through a straw which is different muscles compared to at the breast is more like chewing muscles that's it what else could we use if we're wanting to if we have to do those top ups that we might not want to introduce that confusion sure so the first thing to say is that bottle feeding in the correct way is probably going to be okay, particularly with with a little baby that is just going to suck on anything that you put in their mouth. So paste bottle feeding, P-A-C-E-D, not like wallpaper paste. Sitting the baby up, slowing down the flow of milk, stopping before you think they're completely stuffed. Those sorts of things are going to immediately help with bottle preference or help to avoid some degree of bottle preference the other thing you can do is suck training so letting them suck on your finger uh, before a breastfeed to get the tongue moving in a good way but aside from that cup feeding can be fantastic because it helps to get the tongue out of the mouth and forward which is what we want for good breastfeeding position you could also do something called finger feeding where we tape a tube to the finger and we give the baby a shot of milk through a syringe coming through that tube every time they move their tongue in a good way. So they're learning to move their tongue correctly to get the milk. Or you could use that tube to tape it to your breast and have baby taking their supplements directly from the breast rather than having to top them up separately. Is that a strategy that you sometimes use in your work with relactation as well? Yeah. We have a baby that's willing to latch. We want to take advantage of that. So let's whack them on with a feeding tube. Um, That's going to help mum's milk supply. It's going to help the baby's breastfeeding technique. It's going to increase feelings of connection and bonding and closeness. And mum probably doesn't have to pump as much either as a result. So I am all up for, as long as the baby will latch, I am all up for feeding tubes um, and that breast supplementing. I think it's amazing when it works. Such a good idea. One thing that I love about this new book of yours is the section that you've included about social, cultural and identity considerations of providing breast milk or human milk as an alternative term. What would you like to tell us about that section of the book for those who haven't got it yet? I mean, first of all, Leah, who wrote the section for uh, black and brown women, is just amazing. And what she talks about, you know, the history around black breastfeeding and the challenges that that demographic particularly face is is so important. You know, I would encourage everybody to find out as much as they can about the history of wet nursing, black breastfeeding, and why actually we do need to be talking about it and working especially hard to support those mothers. Um, and then BJ wrote for me a section about LB, LBGTQ+. I always, I always get the letters mixed up. Um, because again, if you're in a, a same-sex relationship, you may want to co-feed. If you don't identify as a woman, we need to be careful about language. And also, if you have any trauma around your chest, uh, it may be that exclusive you know, feeding from your body is too much for you. And combination feeding becomes an alternative that works, you know, and single mothers they have a really hard time getting a break you know if you've got a partner at home then they can hold the baby for an hour where you go to sleep and the baby will probably be content but if it's just you and it's just your boobs you know you don't get a break i mean young mothers are more likely to formula feed than they are to breastfeed so explaining to them that combination feeding is an option may encourage them to give more breast milk for longer it's just such a all of it is just such an area or they are all areas that we don't tend to focus on in lactation. And I wanted to make sure there was a nod to it in the book because very few of us fall into just, you know, a straightforward um, breastfeeding journey, right? There's always other stuff played for all of us, I think. I actually would love to get those couple of people who've written for you to come and do their own talk with me if we could arrange that sometime. You know, diving into reading about the history of, of wet nursing and slavery and all of those things and it's like the history of it in Australia is so recent as well like Mm -hmm. it's yeah it's it's terrifying yeah I'm sure they'd be up for it you mentioned paste bottle feeding before is paste Mm -hmm. bottle feeding and responsive feeding the same thing or are we looking at different concepts so they're kind of interlinked but they are separate so a paste bottle feed pacing the feed means that we're slowing it down um we're, we're making the baby kind of slow down the rate of the feeding so 
traditionally when you bottle feed you lie the baby in the room you tip the bottle up and that milk flows into the baby's mouth they have absolutely no choice about whether or not they take it it's kind of drink or drown if we sit the baby up and we tip the bottle slightly so that the flow is slower the baby has more control over the bottle and they're more likely to be able to pull back and tell us when they've had enough especially if we're watching them if we're watching the baby perhaps arch their back or tense their hands or turn their head away those are clear signs that they've had enough that they're not coping that they want the bottle taken away so responsive feeding is looking at your baby when and noticing the hunger cues but also noticing the satiety cues and noticing when the baby's had enough rather than thinking the tin says i have to make four ounces and you have to drink four ounces actually what's the baby telling you you know maybe they only need two because they're no different to adults in the sense that some days we're really hungry and some days we're not so hungry um i mean this morning i woke up and i wasn't ready for breakfast until a good two hours later but yesterday i woke up starving and i was like feeding me now uh, babies are the same and if we give them the opportunity to tell us when they're hungry and when they're full it tends to balance out pretty well especially with combi feeding when we can always put them back on the boob if we want to yeah and one thing that i love about your whole concept here is not only are we looking for being able to follow the baby to as to when they change mind change their mind about wanting or not wanting milk it's also about if we change our minds about what's working for us or what what yes. isn't working for us i recall when i was learning to drive i was given the instruction by my parents that if ever there was a three lane road you always just drive in the middle lane and then you've got your choice. If you need to turn left or you need to turn right, you only have to go like a little sidestep rather than cut across all of the traffic to get to where you want to go. <laughs> yes. So I feel like combination feeding in a way is almost in the middle if you're not quite sure of which direction you're headed yet. Yes, I like that. And I think if you, if you protect your milk supply, and this is what the book is all about, it's about how to protect your milk supply and make combination feeding work. You've always got that choice about which way you want to go. Do I want to do a bit more formula because breastfeeding really isn't something I'm enjoying? Or do I want to do a bit more breast milk because actually I want to get off these top ups? You've, it's much easier to go one way or the other when you have a degree of a milk supply. Whereas if you stop breastfeeding altogether because you've had a bad week or a bad night or something, it's really, really hard to get that milk back. It's possible but it takes a lot of work and dedication. So it makes perfect sense to me and the clientele I'm working with to encourage them as long as they want to, to keep a milk supply because later on, who knows how you're going to feel, right? A year and a half ago when the really bad fires were happening in Australia, there was a situation where formula had been all cleared off the shelves. There was no access to sterilisation, you know, water supply cut off different towns and whatever. And I think a lot of people sort of had their eyes opened to the fact that formula feeding isn't, that it's not an easy way out kind of choice. It's really harrowing, isn't it? When, you know, we live in first world country, I think that's the phrase I want to use, you know, we're, you know, we're the modern West, we are used to running out to the shop and getting our tuna formula and hitting a button on our kettle and boiling that water and being able to wash the bottles afterwards in proper sterilizing solution and all that sort of stuff and therefore formula feeding is safe you know we've we've that was a lot of the risks around hygiene and storage and all that sort of stuff but the second there's a shortage of formula the second the second the power goes out or the second that there's no water what do you do right and that's awful and no mother wants to be in that situation and i'm not for a second kind of saying oh well everyone who's formula feeding well you shouldn't be doing that because what if there's an armageddon <laughs> um, but it it's something we don't ever have to think about until we really have to think about it we don't live in a world where that's always in the back of our minds because we're very secure and safe in our 21st century bubble and like you've identified it doesn't actually take much to tip that over the edge and knowing that most mothers who are formula feeding don't want to be formula feeding just makes it even worse because how much guilt and shame comes up for you when you can't give your baby formula and you're already feeling rubbish because you haven't breastfed them. I mean, that's just, it makes me just want to wrap my arms around them and give them a really big hug. And it's not fair because they probably wanted to breastfeed. And if we can encourage and help women to keep some sort of a milk supply, 
actually they can increase it and um, there's less pressure on them and other mothers and society if there is ever a shortage again because we have more milk available right i i love it you write about donor milk as an option for combination feeding as well it's not something that's discussed too much in australia although there are informal milk sharing arrangements there's a couple of hospitals in major cities that do take donations of donor milk but it they have to go through a quite a thorough screening process almost like an application process could you give us some info about if we only think co combination feeding is formula what else could it look like yeah and I, I wanted to make a point throughout the book of talking about formula or donor milk so you'll see throughout i mentioned both because it's something that we don't think about we don't think about it in england either we just assume straight away that if our baby is topping up it, it must be formula mm. and some people would even kind of actively recoil when i say you know do you have a friend who's breastfeeding who might like to give you some of her milk you know it's kind of like why would i want to do that that's someone else's milk and i always have to kind of stop myself from going hmm what about the cow you're getting milk from to make your formula? <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting that we can feel icky about another woman's breast milk, but we're okay with a cow's breast milk that doesn't enter our heads. It's strange. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not a vegan. I, I will consume all the ice cream in the world if I give the opportunity. But it just strikes me as really interesting that milk from our own species is weird, but milk from another species is normalised. Um, so in the UK, and it sounds like it's the same in Australia we will often suggest informal milk sharing if it's safe so we'll say is your sister breastfeeding is your best friend breastfeeding is there somebody local to you who you know has plenty of milk and that they stored it really well that you could use that instead of formula because it's human milk so it's better for the baby um it's it kind of um i think there's a link between using human milk and continued breastfeeding success because there's something I can't quite pinpoint it it's almost like I'm using just human milk so I want to carry on using just human milk whereas where you start introducing mm. formula it becomes easy to give like more a and psychological more of that. tipping point a gate of so. some kind yeah that's that's what I've noticed be interesting mm. to know if there's any research on that but I even feel like there'd be something energetic in the whole sisterhood of milk sharing Yes, that's it. And often the mums I've supported in the early days who have used milk from somebody else go on to offer milk to another person once their supply is back and fully established because they've experienced it themselves. And the best thing about all of this, as far as I'm concerned, is it's less money the mother's having to spend on milk from a company. You know, let, let's keep this women supporting women, mothers supporting mothers, rather than having to hand over our money to Nestle and Danone and companies that are making billions off of us you know let, let's screw that right <laughs> let's just uh, keep things keep things between the women where, where possible and the mothers where possible because traditionally really milk sharing and nursing one another's babies was how our species survived to this point <laughs> when i first became a mother the breastfeeding counselor i spoke to told me about why was she telling me this i think it's with my youngest because he wouldn't live and breastfeed um so she was telling me about her grandfather who was fed human milk from a teaspoon for the first six months of his life because he couldn't breastfeed and how his mother's next door neighbor and the woman down the road would, would bring milk over in jugs that they expressed for him by hand and and help to feed this baby by teaspoon i mean how amazing is that that he was breast milk fed or human milk fed and he couldn't breastfeed i just think that's wonderful and that was so normal that was just what you did you just helped out next door by you know <laughs> giving him a bit of milk and now it's seen as like almost a weird hippie thing you know breastfeeding someone else's baby right it's really like oh why would you want to do that but why wouldn't you it's a whole different idea of going and asking for a cup of milk and some sugar from next door neighbor <laughs> isn't it <laughs> yes can i have some human milk please yeah. <laughs> are there any stories that when you were collect collecting people's stories and experiences and information from this book anything that just either blew your mind or broke your heart so I do have a story that I like to share about a friend of mine. Um, so she had, she had a baby and she really struggled to breastfeed and stopped after a few weeks. And then later on, several years later, she got pregnant again. And at this point I was training to be a lactation consultant. So I was doing all my revising. <laughs> she said, I'm pregnant. I was like, yeah, congratulations. And we just chatted a bit. 
And then a bit later, she messaged out of the blue. She, she said, look, I know you do the breastfeeding thing, but I don't want to hear about it. I'm not breastfeeding this time. Don't tell me anything. And I kind of went, can I tell you one thing? And she was like, oh, fine. So I told her that if she gave one colostrum feed, it would be like giving her baby uh, an immunization and it would help to pass his meconium. And that might make things easier for him going forward. And she could stop at that point if she wanted to. And she kind of went, oh, all right, fine. I'll, I'll bear that in mind. So she has the baby. We don't really talk anymore about breastfeeding. I get a message in the morning after the baby's born saying, I fed him three times at the breast and now he's having a little bit of formula because I'm a bit sore. And I just, it was really lovely to watch because as the weeks went on, she started doing more and more breastfeeding and less and less formula feeding. And it was such an organic, genuine transition for her. There was no pressure for me at any point. It was just, you know, what do you want to do? Do you want to get a bit of formula now? Do you want to keep going with the breast? Do you want to try breast compression? You know, what's going to work for you? And within weeks, she was exclusively breastfeeding him and she breastfed him until he was two and a half and only stopped because of a medical reason, um, an unusual medical reason that most, you know, wouldn't usually happen. Seeing how taking that pressure off and seeing how allow, allowing somebody to combi feed or just formula feed with a little bit of information can lead to exclusive breastfeeding long term. I mean, that basically sums up the reason why I wrote the book. Yeah, just hands off. Give the information, yeah. hands off, support people whichever direction that they want to go and see where it ends up. <laughs> see where you end up. And even if she'd given that one breastfeed and then she'd stopped, that baby still would have had the amazing advantages of colostrum and she still would have felt that she'd given him that, you know. But what it did was it made her kind of go, oh, actually, this doesn't hurt and he's quite happy here, so I'm going to do it again next time he wants to feed. And But knowing in the back of her head that she had her formula in her bag that she was planning on using all along, that was okay. It really took the pressure off for her. And I've seen that played out again and again with you know, slightly different scenarios and clients and people I've been supporting voluntarily over the years. And there is a huge benefit to just taking that pressure off for people that aren't sure what they want to do and just going, okay. Let's just see how far we get with this. Mm, I found it really interesting that you said amongst the people that had responded to your surveys and requests for information that the people who responded that they had combination fed actually thought that it had led them to breastfeed or to provide breast milk for a longer time when statistically it's yes. that those people provide breast milk for a shorter time. Do you have any ideas of why that would be? Is it is that the nature of your audience? They're still engaged with you because they're providing breast milk? Or do you think it's just a different way of framing the question? I think when we look, when we look at studies of combination feeding, what we tend to look at is how long was the baby breastfed compared to, um, compared to another dynamic, so to, compared to other babies. You know? So on average, the baby that's combination fed might be breastfed for three months compared to nine months or 12 months. What we don't look at is how long those mothers would have breastfed for if combination feeding wasn't an option. So actually, my experience is if the option isn't there to maintain a milk supply, they very, very quickly end up formula feeding because it's what's the point in carrying on breastfeeding? Why would I keep doing this? If there's no benefit, if it's hard work. So my argument is most of these mothers I suspect would have stopped giving any breast milk sooner if combi feeding wasn't an option for them mm. and therefore their babies have had more breast milk than they would have had if this wasn't a choice they could have made. Because they're able to protect their milk supply because you've explained to them how to do it. Yeah even if it's an extra two weeks of breastfeeding that's two weeks more of immune system support that's two weeks to reduce the risk of breast cancer you know, for mum, that there are wonderful advantages to any breast milk, even if it is for a little bit extra. You know, that's just, it, it, I, I just, I love, I love that it's not black and white. I love that we can sit in the middle with this when, when it's appropriate and support people to give any milk for longer, to feel less of a failure, to, you know, <laughs> to spend less money, to all, all of that, you know, just with how you feel about doing a bit of pumping you know, or, or how do you feel about offering the breast once more? It doesn't have to be this big deal, you know? Yeah, I do. <laughs> but it makes such a big difference. It's a little thing that makes a big difference. And it, it just makes me feel really gooey and, and just so proud of all the women I support when, when it works because they'll come to me and they're like, I'm going to give up, I can't do this. And then they're still breastfeeding in three months' time. You know, that's just, oh, it's amazing. Women are amazing. 
where can we find you to tap into all of your resources <laughs> and your humour and your support too? <laughs> So Facebook is the best place to get hold of me because it's where I have my biggest following. So I tend to spend a bit more time there. So I'm Lucy Ruddle IBCLC on Facebook. And I'm also Lucy Ruddle IBCLC on Instagram, which has a slightly smaller following. I'm not very good at Instagram. It seems hard to, uh, to build the following over there. So uh, please follow me on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do our best to get your, um, to get your audience a bit bigger. <laughs> I'm pushing for 10K at the moment. I'm stuck on my 9K. And it's been there for ages. So the more people that wants to follow me there, the better. Awesome. Awesome. And I know <laughs> on your website, you have a whole lot of different little guides and, and actually you have a, some wonderful support options available. So if, if you're not actually somebody who is looking at breastfeeding, providing human milk, any kind of infant feeding, but it's an area that you're passionate about, you actually do have some sort of donation and sponsorship options to be I able do. to get some of this support directly to the people who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford it. Currently, we're setting up an online clinic that will be run over Zoom. And here in the UK, if you access anything through the NHS, it's free to you, but the practitioners get paid. And I wanted to kind of try and recreate that on a very tiny scale. So we are just in the process now of taking applications for newly qualified lactation consultants to run a clinic over Zoom that will be free for the parents to access, but people have donated to my Buy Me A Coffee funds to pay for the lactation consultants to do the work. So they're getting paid. The mothers are not happy to pay for it. Um, everyone's a winner. So Buy Me A Coffee slash Lucy Ruddle, I think it is, um, will bring up my page where you can either buy fact sheets or courses or just literally buy me a virtual coffee. And everything that I sell on there goes into that accessible fund to provide support that parents don't have to pay for. What you're doing is so amazing. What's some of the backlash that you've received? Because I know people have oh. trolled you pretty hard. <laughs> yeah, it's been quiet for a while, thank goodness. Um, I, I had several run-ins with people from um, the Fed is best line of the way that are doing things. Um, I, I've been accused of being some awful things that I won't repeat here. But the most hurtful thing for me is being accused of trying to take advantage of vulnerable mothers because I charge for my support. And I still get that a lot. I still get a lot of accusations that you should be doing this for free. Well, if I did it for free, I couldn't do it because I would have to go and do another job in order to pay for my bills. So I might only see one or two mums a week if I did it for free. But if I charge people, I can see 15 to 20 mums a week and keep a roof over my children's head and take money away from, from the formula companies in the big industry, right? Because, you know, the other thing about being a lactation consultant is it's not something you just wake up one day and like, I'm going to call myself an IBCLC. It takes four years to to get all your stuff sorted and then you have to sit an exam and then we have to keep up to date with our training and we have to recertify after five years and there's insurance and so much stuff that goes into it we are experts in our field so of course we should be paid for what we do right and yes it would be wonderful if the nhs would sort themselves out and, and put us all on <laughs> on their system so that we're free for everybody but we're not you know and we have to we have to earn a living you know i'm guessing it's similar for you as a doula yeah, yes. Um, <laughs> similar for IBCLCs in Australia as well. We have Medicare mm -hmm. instead of the NHS, which either pays public health or pays a sub, like a rebate for some of the cost of appointments of different health professionals. But um, post birth rehab and physical therapy is really, really poorly funded. Lactation is really, really poorly funded. And I don't think that these would be issues. I often think about like if men were having problems with like, erectile dysfunction when their baby arrived as much as women have problems with their pelvic floor would that be funded probably they'd probably be sorted exactly. straight away i was at a conference when we were allowed to go to conferences mm. back in the day and i was listening to amy brown speak and i can't remember exactly what she said but just as it was there is more funding for erectile dysfunction than there is for all of postnatal stuff combined um, so, because men are more important, apparently, you know, the, and their penises, particularly um, their appendages. <laughs> yes, then then women, you know, bringing children into the world and nourishing them and keeping them alive. Um, we we don't count, you know, strange creatures that women are. We can't mm. possibly study us. Um, it's deeply frustrating. 
Thank you so much for being on the podcast today, Lucy. I have loved speaking with you and I actually can't wait to dive in a bit further to your book. There's a couple of chapters that we really didn't get to cover at all in this conversation and I'm really keen to read it. So it's called Mixed Up, Combination Feeding by Choice or Necessity and you can find it anywhere that you buy books online. You can. Thank you so much, Anna. Thanks for listening. I hope you love this episode as much as I loved recording it. If you wish, you can subscribe and leave a five-star rating on your podcast platform. And if you love my work, please be sure to follow along with me on social media at Anna Cusack Postpartum on Instagram and Facebook and grab my book from www.annacusack.com.au slash book. Until next time, bye.